Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Rebuilding Better, South Africa's Green and Inclusive Industrial Policies. I'm Hannes McNulty and as Senior Green Industry Advisor, I lead GGKP's Green Industry Platform, which was recently launched in 2019. We are very, very happy to have you all with us here today. And of course, we hope that you are all healthy and safe. This is actually the first webinar in a series focused on rebuilding better, where experts will be discussing themes ranging from sand governance to green bonds to the role of training and academia in building back better. Now, the next webinar in the series will actually take place at the same time next week. And that webinar will be looking at how innovative materials and systems can play an important role in supporting SMEs to become more resource efficient. And you can register for that re uh, webinar next week, already now, at ggkp.org forward slash resource efficient SMEs. Now, if you're not familiar with GGKP or the Green Growth Knowledge Platform, I would encourage you to visit our different web platforms and actually also join the growing community that we have at ggkp.org forward slash subscribe. So today we are very fortunate to be joined by green industrial policy experts from the German Development Institute, the International Trade Center, the Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies Institute, and the United Nations Environment Program, as well as academics and the Chief Director of South Africa's Department of Trade and Industry. We'd really welcome all your comments and questions that you can submit through the question box. And I'd really encourage you to submit these as it's, it's a fantastic opportunity to engage directly with the panel of experts and pose your questions to them. After the webinar itself, we'd appreciate it if you could take a few minutes to complete our short survey. This type of feedback is very important to us to help shape our future webinars. It's also worth noting that a full recording of the webinar will be available on our website at ggkp.org. Now, before we get started with the webinar itself, I'd like to take a moment to introduce you to the Global Opportunities for Sustainable Development Goals, or Go for SDGs initiative, which was launched by UNEP and its partners in 2019. Go for SDGs will be sharing innovative practices for greener economies and sustainable production and consumption that can then be taken to scale. Importantly, Go for SDGs also provides a wide range of access to tools and services offered by Go for SDGs partners through a recently launched menu of services. The, the Go for SDGs knowledge based tools uh, include, for example, the GGKP's Green Industry Platform, which itself provides SMEs with information on how to cost effectively green their operations, and the Partnership for Action on Green Economies Green Industrial Policy and Trade Toolbox, which includes green industry and trade policy instruments and information on how they can be used. Go for SDGs also pro, uh, offers training and capacity development opportunities for SMEs. This including through the One Planet Network's Product Sustainability Information Hub and ILO Score Training, which, uh, for example, shares best practices in the manufacturing and service sectors and thereby helps SMEs participate in global supply chains. It also offers training and capacity development opportunities for policymakers including through the UNCC Green Industrial Policy Online course, which is currently open for registration. So now I'd like to move on quickly to the webinar itself. And it's my pleasure to be able to introduce the moderator for today's event, Vanessa Erog Bogbo, Chief of Sustainable and Inclusive Value Chains at the International Trade Center. Vanessa has over 20 years of experience in private sector development, in international organizations as well as in the private sector. At ITC, she oversees environmental and social sustainability, as well as the work of the Outstanding She Trades Initiative, which is connecting 3 million women to the market by 2021. So Vanessa, I'm delighted to be able to welcome you to today's webinar and hereby turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Hannes, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this very timely and important webinar 
rebuilding better South Africa's green and inclusive industrial policies. I want to thank uh, the Green Growth Knowledge Platform for inviting the International Trade Center to be part of this discussion. And for those of you who aren't familiar with ITC, we're the Joint Technical Assistance Agency of the United Nations and the World Trade Organization. And our mandate is to support SMEs from developing countries to internationalize. And we do this whilst placing what we like to call good trade at the heart of all that we do. And that is trade that's socially and environmentally sustainable as well as inclusive. Now there's a broad consensus on the need for a transition to a green and regenerative economy. The COVID-19 crisis has underscored the urgency for us to transform our economies into ones that are resilient and green. This afternoon, based on insights from South Africa, the discussion will focus on how green industrial policy can stimulate low carbon growth, boost competitiveness, create jobs, and avert future crises. We'll start by showcasing the United Nations Environment Programme's Green Economy Policy Review Methodology. And alongside that, we'll have a presentation of the findings from its application to an analysis of South Africa's industrial policy framework. Then we'll delve into more detail on various related issues, including the country's COVID-19 recovery plan and economic recovery plan, as well as how green policies can help South Africa thrive in the economy of the future. We'll look at how um, addressing inequality is going and much, much more. So we're truly privileged to have with us this afternoon a panel of incredible experts and I'll introduce all of them before we start the discussion. Let me start with Claudia Asman. She's a program officer at the United Nations Environment Programs Economy Division, where she serves as an expert on green economy and green industrial policy, helping governments review their policies for meaningful change. Gayla Montmasson Clare is a senior economist at the Trade and Industrial Policy Strategies Research House, where he leads work on sustainable growth. Uh, Gayla is also a research associate at the University of Johannesburg's Center for Competition, Regulation, and Economic Development. Gerhard Furi is the chief director of the Department of Trade and Industry of the Republic of South Africa and brings the government voice to this panel. Samantha Ashman is an Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Johannesburg, where she acts as Director of the University's MPhil program in Industrial Policy. And she's also um, currently a visiting professor at the African Studies Center at the University of Oxford. And last but not least, Tillman Altenberg. Uh, he's the head of the Department for Sustainable Economic and Social Development at the German Development Institute, Germany's think tank, for development policy. So I'm going to start by handing over the floor to Claire to um, introduce us a little bit to what uh, UNEP's Green Economy Policy Review methodology is. Over to you, uh, Claudia. Thank you very much, Vanessa. It's my pleasure to also welcome you on behalf of the United Nations Environment Programme to this webinar. UNEP has been working with the South African Department of Environment, Forestry and Fisheries, the Department of Trade, Industry and Competition, and the South African Research Institute TIPS on a Green Economy Policy Review. This review looked into South Africa's industrial policy framework. The review has been conducted before COVID, but its outcomes spilled nevertheless an excellent backdrop for our discussion today. And I therefore would like to quickly introduce the review. It has been conducted by pilot testing a methodology that UNEP developed in the framework of a project funded by the European Union. The methodology can be applied to a narrow scope of one policy or a targeted uh, set of key green economy policies, as is the case of South Africa's policy review of the industrial policy framework. The review itself has the objective to provide forward-looking recommendations for enhanced green economy policy making and it assesses a selected policy's effectiveness, and it also assesses the policy's coherence with national and international policy frameworks, such as the SDGs or the Paris Agreement. The methodology itself is very flexible and can be applied to policies at any point in the policy cycle, from policy design to policy implementation evaluation, 
And it also looks at the pro policy process as one focus of the review, because many of the policies are actually in their early stages of the policy cycle. Um, and it will be assessed how the policy has been developed and how it has moved through the stages of this policy cycle um, in the pillar of policy process. Uh, the methodology has been pilot tested in three countries so far, and besides South Africa, these include uh, China. Uh, there it looked at eco compensation schemes in Hainan province, and it has also been applied in Mongolia, where the methodology was used to conduct a midterm review of the country's national green development policy. So the methodology is quite versatile. In South Africa, applying the methodology helped to take stock of the current status of the country's industrial policy framework and its green elements. And it made a couple of very interesting recommendations that we will um, hear later from uh, Gelo about. Amongst others, it highlighted the need to build the capacity of all stakeholders across units, departments um, uh, involved in industrial policies. It highlighted the need to promote mainstreaming of sustainability in industrial policies on the one hand, but also mainstreaming of industrial development in environmental policies. And it had highlighted the need to develop a well-managed transition plan um, based on a social dialogue to really um, uh, help bring about structural change. But we will hear more from Gaylor, uh, Moma St. Clair from TIPS about that in a bit. I'd like to take this opportunity and thank the European Union for their financial report for the development of the methodology and also for their support to conduct the green economy policy review in the three pilot countries. Um, we are very grateful to really hear now about the uh, findings from South Africa's green industrial policy review um, and um, hand it over back to you, Vanessa. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Claudia. Very interesting. Tell us, you know, if the government wanted to apply um, their methodology, how, how could they go about that? So the methodology um, is a handbook. It's quite, um, I would say, intuitive and easy to use. Um, and it can be applied by a research institute, but also could be applied by government officials uh, in, in different ministries. So the, the handbook really provides a step-by-step -step, uh, approach, um, moves through the policy cycle, as I said, um, and also provides guiding questions that can be applied um, when uh, assessing those three pillars that I talked about, policy process, policy design, and policy implementation and uh, effectiveness. Um, and it can take, it's not a one size fits all approach. So it can take different forms as it can be applied to just one policy or a set of policies or a policy framework. Fantastic, it's super interesting. And I'm sure we'll come back to this uh, further on in the discussion. Um, but I, I'll hand the, the floor over to Gayla to give us a sense of the findings um, from the application of this methodology on uh, South Africa's industrial policy framework. Gayla, over to you. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Vanessa, and thanks, uh, Claudia, as well, for, for the introduction. Um, very pleased to, to share some of the findings of the, of the review on South Africa's industrial policy uh, today. I think before I start, it's important to remember you know, the South African context. Because of the history of South Africa, we have a fairly developed industrial capacity uh, and very strong industrial policy in the country. But at the same time, we also have a country that is one of the most carbon intensive economies worldwide uh, and has the infamous title of being one of the most unequal societies globally. Um, with fairly high levels of poverty and inequality. And I think that shapes really uh, our thinking around green industrial policy in, in the country. As Claudia highlighted, we looked both at policy design uh, and process on the one hand and policy implementation on the other hand when it came to industrial policy, particularly from a green industrial policy angle. If we look at the policy design and the policy process, what we find is that actually in the South African case, we have many green shoots in our policies. We have many policies that talk about an inclusive green economy in one way or the other. That's the case in our national development plan, uh, which is a 2030 vision. 
That's also the case in, in our industrial policy documents, our industrial policy action plan historically, or some other documents like our national strategy for sustainable development that actually makes a reference to going beyond GDP. You know, I don't think there's many policy documents that do that globally. You know? So it's quite progressive in, in that respect. Where we fall short is that too often the green economy still remains boxed in as a sector. It's seen as a sector that is and not an economy-wide or society-wide transformation. That means that as much as in theory, we could have some good coherence between the policy documents. If we look at it in practice, it's still perfectible. Um, there's still a lack of consensus or clarity on which options or which direction to go. That's very clear if you look at our energy policy. We have a policy and it's quite clear, but it's still significant debate about which technologies, which kind of electricity mix, energy mix we should have, despite the fact that we actually have a policy that is very clear. Uh, of course, and I know some of my field panels will go back to that, coordination uh, remains a problem you know, between government departments, but also between government and social partners. And that's despite having very vibrant uh, social dialogue in the country. South Africa has a very unique organization called NEDLAC, which is the National Economic Development and Labor uh, Council, which gathers government, the private sector, labor unions, and civil society to discuss and agree on the key policy directions for the country. That's very unique. The social dialogue is very much in the fabric of the country. But despite this, of course, coordination still remains uh, a challenge. If we look at the implementation side, in terms of what is our industrial policy doing and does it support the transition to uh, you know, a green economy? What we find is that we have a wide ranging um, set of tools in our industrial policy toolbox, if you want, that we use to promote an inclusive green economy. We actually have regulatory measures, uh, standards, we have carbon budgets, we have uh, pollution prevention plans that are mandatory for sectors. We have many others that are being implemented. We also have a number of economic measures the carbon tax is generally the one everybody talks about, but we have others. We have a tax incentive for energy efficiency. We have energy uh, uh, renewable uh, depreciation, renewable energy depreciation framework as well. Um, we've got a tax incentive for R&D. Um, and we've got many other schemes that government is involved in, you know, from obviously a renewable energy procurement program. That's quite prominent and uh, very important globally. Uh, we've got special economic zones that are being used to promote industrial development as well. Uh, and we've got a national cleaner production center, which is very active in providing support to industry, as well as information to the economy around how to move towards a greener economy. So we've got many tools that actually we use already in the country to support a transition to an inclusive green economy from an industrial development perspective. But when we look deeper, we obviously find areas where we could do better. Yeah. The first one really, if you, if you look at it, is around fossil fuel subsidies. Fossil fuel subsidies are still quite high in South Africa. Uh, direct subsidies, about 2% of GDP. If you include externalities, such as you know, greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution, it, it jumps to a whooping 13% of GDP. So it's huge really in terms of you know, the impact. Our R&D expenditure still below 1% of GDP. So still too low compared to you know, global standard. And only a quarter of that goes towards directly green economy related interventions. If we look at our regulatory and you know, economic instruments, we have quite a few, as I said, but the integration of those could be better. Right. One of the few, countries that has both a carbon tax and a carbon budget scheme. Yeah. So it's important that they work together and in hand. They do speak to each other, but the alignment could be, could be improved. Um, when it comes to standards, you know, if we mention, for example, the ISO standards, you know, 14,001 and 50,001, which are the most relevant when it comes to energy and environmental management. We lag behind our peers 
it's very clear compared to BRICS, compared to other uh, uh, emerging economies, we like Riftera Libyan. When it comes to our uh, economic zones, you know, we use special economic zones as a key tool to support industrial development. But we have two flagships when it comes to a green economy. One, green tech, special economic zone, the Atlantis SEZ in the Western Cape. And then we have one flagship eco-industrial park in the Eastern Cape, the East London Industrial Development Zones. But what we need to do, of course, is make sure that all industrial development zones become champions in terms of eco-industrial parks and supporting green technologies. We're not quite there yet. In terms of our trade policy, another key aspect of industrial policy. If we look at South Africa's trade in green goods, we see that South Africa's imports of green goods are about twice the size of the exports. That tells us that there is room, really, to improve the picture area through industrialization, import substitution, and further exporting uh, some of the green goods that South Africa produces. We have significant trade risk from climate change, really, as being one of the most carbon intensive economies globally. We've done some work on that as part of uh, other research, looking at the climate and trade interplay in South Africa. And it really shows the risk uh, of the South African economy in that respect. So going forward, um, as Claudia alluded to earlier, there's four key areas where we think we can really strengthen our industrial policy to move closer to a green industrial policy framework. The first one is around capacity building. We need to really ensure that there's cross pollinization between the people who work on industrial policy and the people who work on environmental or social policy. They need to understand each other a lot better. They for now clearly work in relatively separate worlds. Uh, and, and separate communities. And I think it's important that we really cross pollinize in that respect and that we embed sustainability in the performance of you know, individuals and institutions in the country. The second aspect is policy mainstreaming, as Claudia mentioned. Making sure that industrial policy really embeds sustainable development in, in, in its development and that vice versa. You know, environmental and social policy really understands the context of industrial development and reflects on this. Um, in the longer run, it needs to, to lead to a shift of the incentives. Our industrial policy needs to shift away from business as usual to really supporting you know, green industries and the greening of existing industries. The third dimension is around information and, and, and data. Um, there's a lot available, but we still miss you know, a lot of information. Um, actually, our National Statistic Office did a, a review of uh, the progress in terms of SDG in South Africa. And if you read the report, the main conclusion is actually that we cannot say if South Africa is progressing or not, because we do not have the information for most of the indicators. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done in that respect, and we can build that knowledge going forward. And last, but, but not least, uh, we can do a lot better in terms of our transition planning. What is the vision for the country uh, in terms of a just transition to an inclusive green economy? It's very topical. We talk a lot about it, but we need to move from social dialogue to now the design and the implementation. Um, what are our roadmaps for specific sectors? And what uh, are the plans for the country to ensure that we don't just have a transition to a green economy, but we have a real just transition to an inclusive green economy going forward. Um, I'll leave it at this for now and look forward to get into the detail uh, of that. Thank you. There's just so much to unpack there. Thank you um, very much, uh, Gayla. I think um, what I saw you present was a bit of a mixed picture, but with some very good specific recommendations on areas to focus, 
um, you know, you highlighted uh, the many uh, different policies that refer to green development, including the National Development Plan. Um, but the fact that uh, because a lot of these um, policies are taken in from a sector focus or almost in a silo, um, there, there seems to be a lack of um, clarity and consensus on which direction to go as a result of these um, policies and also um, you know highlighting the history of South Africa um, strong history on social dialogue be um, you know being um, something that South Africa has done for such a long time despite this there being a lack of coordination between the different um, the departments. And then it was interesting uh, to hear you highlight this um, wide ranging set of tools that could support the transition to um, the green economy, as well as some of the economic uh, measures um, that are in place. And, and then highlighting uh, some of the things that you know could be done a bit better. Um, things like uh, the fact that there's a relatively low rate of R&D expenditure, um, the fact that um, green uh, green uh, approaches could be mainstreamed across special economic zones, um, as opposed to being, um, you know, in in a couple of specific um, economic zones that are focused on green. Um, you talked a bit about uh, there being a possible market opportunity looking at the high level of impact of uh, in, the high level of import of uh, green goods uh, compared to the uh, exports of, of, of green goods. So really a very interesting introduction. And then I love that you finished with some specific um, uh, recommendations, as it were, or some specific reflections, which were um, first and foremost um, really getting uh, the industrial, environmental, and social policy communities together to cross pollinate. Um, and secondly, um, you know, having industrial policy embed sustainability and vice versa. Uh, third, um, better information and data. And finally, um, really creating a vision. Um, that would drive the design and implementation going forward. So thank you very much um, for that, Gayla. I hope I've captured the essence of, of, of what you said uh, well enough. Um, I'm going to now broaden out the discussion a little bit and call in um, uh, Gerhard, uh, you know, to based on, on a bit on, on, on a reflection of this and, and other things that are going on within the South African economy. How does South Africa's COVID-19 recovery strategy and economic recovery strategy uh, support um, green industry? Gerhard, over to you. Uh, good afternoon and thank you very much for the opportunity. Um, Gaylor mentioned that uh, we are one of the most carbon intensive economies in the world. We're also one of the most unequal and even before this COVID-19 pandemic, uh, we had, didn't have really very good economic growth. Um, and we have very high unemployment. So it's quite a challenge we face. And then um, I think what we, we already touched on a little bit is um, our industrial uh, complex is very highly dependent on imported components to manufacture goods. There's virtually not a single product manufactured in South Africa that does not have a relatively high level of imported componentry of materials in it. And our even our retail sector is very highly dependent on imports. So one of the very important lessons we learned in this COVID pandemic was when the supply chains were disrupted, it really had a very negative impact on our ability to manufacture and it had a, a very uh, um, important impact on our ability to supply. So I think the most important lesson that we have to learn out of this is we've got to really rethink our supply chain models and we have to rethink our business models. The uh, in years ago, the um, manufacturing sector comprised up to 25% of the GDP in South Africa, and nowadays it's below 10%. Uh, 
and really if you want to make any effort to um, address the inequality unemployment you have to invest in sectors that has got a relatively high economic multiplier and manufacturing is an obvious place to to look at um, the other aspect that we didn't really touch on is that the electricity supply in South Africa has traditionally been from coal-fired power plants and the bulk of these power plants are very close to the end of their life. We've got two relatively new coal plants but the rest of them have reached end of life or are very close to that and we see massive um, maintenance issues with these power plants and uh, we've seen quite a lot of uh, blackouts and uh, uh, load shedding, what we call it in South Africa, over the last couple of years. And that will probably continue for, for, the, for the short term until we can put more generation capacity on the grid. So the, the, the positive side of the whole thing is um, it can only get better. Coal, the future of coal is not what it used to be, the, the uh, global demand for coal is going down quite rapidly and the profitability of coal mines are going down. So the, we've seen that the price of renewable energy is now below the price of coal-fired electricity in South Africa. So the, um, in our electricity planning, the bulk of future supply will be in the solar, wind, uh, storage and renewable space. I think we'll also see a bit of gas uh, in the new in the new um, electricity supply in the in the future. So it, it can only get better. So the plan that government has to address this COVID is very much aligned to the um, economic recovery plan in general. So first of all, we have to put electricity on the grid. So Government wants to spend significant amount on infrastructure. In the electricity space, we have designed it in such a way that the bulk of the generation will be private investment. Uh, with, with a, um, currently, the model is that the utility will buy the electricity, but there's also a move towards liberalizing those markets where the, the, the buying and selling of electricity will hopefully in future become much easier and private uh, investors can hopefully quite soon in, uh, connect to the grid, sell electricity into the grid and, and buy electricity from the grid. Uh, a big other opportunity we have in South Africa is the South African power pool, which we do not really participate in, but it's, it is available to us to export electricity and trade in electricity. And it's something we're really pushing hard for and hope that we can soon uh, tap into those opportunities. The other area um, I think that's important is uh, in the water sector. South Africa is a, is a more or less an arid country. We uh, have faced water shortages in the past and our predictions are that we will within the ne next decade run into quite severe water shortages unless we do something about it. Now with the assistance of TIPS, we've done significant research in the water space over the last few years. And it's our view that it's entirely possible to, to deal with this water shortage. We basically have to become more water efficient. We have to invest in aging infrastructure. We have to invest in backlogs, in maintenance. Uh, and we basically have to invest in, in new infrastructure. Uh, the numbers we've done on this is that um, the solutions to address our water challenges um, does have a quite a short payback period quite often. It, most of these solutions have a positive return on investment. So it's a case of just getting everybody on the same page and, and trying to move to address this. The, one of the challenges we have in the space is our constitution uh, guarantees water as a basic right. So people are re not uh, very keen to pay for water. So the price of water in South Africa, in, in our view, is, is way too low. If you can fix the price of water, the, 
the uh, investment in the water sector uh, I think would be dealt with in uh, much easier. Other areas that uh, government plans to invest in is in uh, transport and logistics. Our port charges are very high, so if we can address our port charges, our uh, rail sector, there's a, lots of opportunity to invest in the rail sector. We still use uh, excessive road transport to in South Africa, which is of course very carbon intensive. And then um, I think very important, and this is also a, a, a big lesson we learned out of this COVID-19 pandemic is investment in the digital economy. The digital economy, um, and, and we must also thank UNIDO in this space, is uh, um, the awareness on, on what the digital economy can bring to and support an economy is very low in South Africa, but um, the COVID has showed us that there are many, many solutions in this space to not only address supply chain cha challenges, it can address um, improvements in efficiency and productivity in manufacturing, and it can help uh, enter this fourth industrial revolution space. Um, Typically, a problem we had in South Africa is the digital economy has always been seen as um, electronic commerce. And the fear was always there that if we are too, too aggressive into the digital economy, we'll we will end up buying everything from China through electronic commerce. So quite important to drive the, the awareness in this case. So Gaylor has mentioned the real problem in South Africa is not to develop and design policies and even develop and design act implementation. The real problem we have is um, to uh, coordinate, to get the different government departments to align their policies and to make these policies um, acceptable to investors. Uh, and this has been a real problem in the past. So um, in the last year or so, since uh, President Ramaphosa became president of South Africa, they've introduced a new methodology called um, the master plan process. So basically the master plan process is uh, quite a significant move away from the previous model where government did a lot of the planning and government used try to use legislation and whatever to to drive the economy it's a, it's a move towards a stakeholder driven approach where you basically try to get a meeting of minds between the key players in industry labor and government and get everybody to um, be comfortable so that investment can take place and one of the important um, uh, instrument to use is to use empirical evidence to basically get consensus or, or buy in from stakeholders. So we basically look at data, we look at cost benefit analysis, we look at the return on investment and these kind of numbers and we're finding in the master plans that we've so far implemented that it's a very useful tool to to get um, the different stakeholders on the same page. And, um, and that's basically the way we're trying to, um, to address that problem going forward. So, so in a nut nutshell, I think the, the post-COVID approach is to, to drive industrialization, to decouple our industrialization from our carbon intensity, um, and to use government infrastructure spending to act as a catalyst, but also to, um, to look at areas that we can replace imports uh, to, to help uh, improve our supply chain situation. Um, and that's basically, I think, where I'll end, and I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions whenever you get there. Thank you so much, Gerhard. That's such a, um, a really interesting um, picture that you paint, and it really brings, seems to bring to life, at least to me, 
the types of issues that um, that 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 are being considered um, there in South Africa. Um, just a couple of things. Number one, I, I I'm really pleased that you mentioned this um, investment in the digital economy. Um, indeed, it goes way beyond e-commerce, and um, you mentioned right at the top of your remarks um, the supply chain disruption um, that you know that faced that a lot of companies faced in South Africa and across the world. We've seen this happening. Um, so this this use of uh, digital economies for supply chains, for information, for healthcare diagnostics, but for uh, more efficiency. Um, in, in, in manufacturing, um, I think this, this is a really important um, area to focus on. I, I wanted to ask, you know, you, you talked about, um, you know, uh, this sh shift to uh, renewables um, and, and, and uh, cleaner electricity and um, uh, making uh, water more e efficient, dealing with the infrastructure and so on. And, and this seems like quite a lot um, that's required. It's, it's a big menu. A question I had was around skills. Are the people and workers of South Africa skilled uh, and prepared to, to start taking on these different types of jobs in, in evolving sectors? I think Gailor can maybe help us on this question as well. I mean, for example, we re he recently did some research in the, the coal mining industry, and we one of the projects is to what we call the just transition, to get coal workers into other areas. Now, what was interesting is coal workers typically earn salaries that's above average in South Africa, but if you look at the skills levels of coal workers, it's below average. So that, in a way, highlights what you're saying. So skills is a is a challenge. What we've seen in many uh, industries is um, the training sector in South Africa. The the barriers to entry is quite low. So to upskill workers is relatively easy. The the challenge, of course, is uh, in any industrial setup you need. Um, factory workers, you need middle management and you need top management. And and there is definitely a problem. Um, a, a recent survey we did on the foundry industry, for example, we found that um, in foundries, you typically need metallic, metallurgical engineers and metallurgical scientists. And if we benchmark ourselves against uh, other countries in the world, uh, we are definitely below we don't have the numbers we require, so skills is a problem. Gayla, did you want to jump in briefly as well with any perspectives? Yes, yes, briefly, thank you. Yeah, I think, look, I would agree with, with Khayat on, on, on this. I think, I think we have a, a bit of a dichotomy in South Africa when it comes to skills relevant for the green economy. Yeah. If you're already skilled and you want to basically train yourself as a champion you know, in the green economy. There's plenty on offer. And I think you know, we, we really uh, have great, great champions in, in the country. People are really skilled in developing you know, a, a green economy related activities. But this has not filtered through the entire sort of skills development and capacity building and also sort of you know tertiary education um here we're still lagging very much behind and and uh, there are a number of industries where we really need to start building the skills from the ground you know it's not just sufficient to have champions you know you need to really build those skills across the board um and i think that's where we're trying to put some emphasis going forward um, there's some really interesting initiatives about in the country around building green skills, which is just going beyond actually the traditional understanding of green skills and saying no, we need to build those kind of skills in every single industry, every single sector. Um, we just at the beginning of this in the country, 
Uh, and I think that's where we then need to be ready to start getting some of the opportunities. You know? and, and I think some of the existing initiatives in the country are also trying to repurpose themselves. We have had some really good research and development in the battery value chain in South Africa, which at the onset was really there to say, let's try and develop an IP, you know, significant interior property for South Africa. But actually, it has to some extent been repurposed to build skills in the country and has been a lot more efficient in that, so that these are skills that can be taken up by industry and, and help grow uh, a green economy in the country. Thanks so much. I'm going to skip ahead because I hope that we will have some more time for discussion as well uh, during the course of the afternoon. And I'm going to skip ahead to Samantha to uh, zoom in a bit on inequality and how green industrial policy interventions have addressed inequality in South Africa. Samantha, over to you. Thank you, Vanessa, and thank you to um, everybody else on the panel and everyone taking part. I'm going to make three points as quickly as I possibly can. And the first point I want to make, which I think is, is really worth emphasising, is to say that the report is good. Um, you know, I've gone through it, and, uh, you know, the relief on the, on the panellists, but no, I think the report is good. And I think that one thing it says quite rightly is that South Africa today lacks a development vision and that it needs a development, a big development vision, a big, the big picture, and that South Africa is really still, um, you know, it's still locked into a highly unsustainable path. And that's, you know, it's, it's locked into an unsustainable path, both in terms of the economy and the society as a whole. On every front, we're locked into an unsustainable path. And it says that very clearly, and, and, and it's, it's good to read. Secondly, I want to say that the connection, it seems to me, between green industrial policy and tackling inequality is the critical question. And that it's long been the critical question. Um, you know, I think people quite rightly have said, and Gayla said it, and it says it in the report, that we have this highly, on the one hand, we've got this highly carbon intensive path. And on the other hand, we've got this very unequal society, the highest level of inequality in the world. Those two things are connected, and they've always been connected. Um, and that's important to say because you've got an economy which is the, the core of the economy, historically and unfortunately till today, you've got this very extractive heavy industry core. So we've, we've got coal and we've still got coal as the primary driver of, of, of electricity, but we've got mining of other commodities more generally. We've got aluminium smelting, we've got steel, we've got, you know, we've got heavy industry, we've got liquid fuel from coal and so forth. So we've got this very sort of dirty, extractive, capital intensive core that doesn't really generate huge, huge numbers of jobs. Um, uh, and, you know, it's not, it's, 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 it's not inclusive. And that, that's, that's connected. The fact that we've got the, the highest inequality in, this, uh, in the world, and we've got, you know, you've got 40% unemployment, really 40% unemployment, you know, 40% really, per, nearly permanently excluded, really, from the, form, the formal economy in, in any meaningful way and from, from national income. You know, you look at the, you know, I mean, people debate the figures, but, you know, 60% of the population are really dependent upon social grants more than they are from labour market earnings. You know, that's a, that's a massive amount of poverty in the in, in, in the country. And that it's a, so it's a highly extractive and simultaneously racially unjust society because it's, it's, it's historically it's a white minority rule, black, obviously a black majority country. So it's racially unjust along with huge amounts of levels of gender injustice at the same time. So those two things are historically very connected and they're still with us with us today. But, so then the, my third point is it seems to me a, an absolutely critical way to connect these two dimensions and a, and a really strong, strong, strong point for green industrial policy is its capacity to generate jobs um, and to generate green jobs or what some people call climate jobs to try to change the productive structure of the economy so that it is both more inclusive and greener. 
Um, and that seems to me to be, it's got to be central to, to, to putting, to making a just transition. And that there, and there are lots that we can talk about expanding employment in wind and solar power. Uh, we can talk about retrofitting buildings, which very, very often doesn't, doesn't go on. Um, you know, we can talk about um, the massive, massive expansion of public transport, which is desperately needed because people travel long distances, they get expensive, dangerous, often dangerous taxis, they have to get up at four o'clock in the morning and walk long, long, long distances to get to the stop and so forth. So there's a, there's a huge, huge potential in, in, in those, sorts, those sorts of areas, I think, to combine the, 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 the struggle for greater climate, climate justice and greater inequality. My very, very final point 3B, <laughs> I, I shall sneak in, is that all those, you know, all those jobs, all those people, they'll be paying tax, you know, and they will be contributing longer term to expanding the fiscal space. And, you know, sadly speaking, in South Africa today, we're actually talking, in, uh, we're in a, a situation, given the COVID crisis and, uh, you know, fear about mounting debt, a fiscal contraction. And actually, that's a disaster. That's a disaster for green industrial policy. It's a disaster, it's a, it's a disaster for sort of broader social economic equity issues more generally. Thank you. It's, sorry, it's a bit awkward with the muting and unmuting, but Samantha, I, I, you know, you didn't need to rush through that. You, you could have gone to a point four and a point five. Um, that was, I really enjoyed listening to that. I'm uh, passionate about many of these issues myself. Um, and, you know, I, I think you gave a really great rally call and, um, you know, you 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 brought to attention our attention, you know, some really stark realities um, about the inequality, the rate of unemployment, um, the injustice, the gender injustice, the racial injustice. Um, but at the same time, I like that you pointed to um, areas where there's potential. So there is potential, there are opportunities, and it's a matter of how um, South Africa can actually exploit those opportunities and, um, and flip that coin. I wondered if, um, I don't know, Tillman wanted to, I, I'm just calling on people unexpectedly, but I wondered, Tillman, if you wanted to comment on, 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 on Samantha's um, point. Okay, um, my pleasure. Um, I think, uh, yeah, let me, let me start by saying that uh, uh, really the, 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 the report uh, that um, uh, Gaylor and, and um, Claudia presented in the beginning is, 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 is quite remarkable. It shows a long list of very interesting green initiatives in South Africa. And I can only recommend you all to, to read the, the government review document that, that, that they presented here. It's, it's really kind of so rich in, in empirical examples. However, um, there's a certain limitation and, and most of the, 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 the impressive projects that, that I read about are somehow grant-based, they are donor-funded, which, which creates a problem of, of massive replication. And uh, the key thing a, a, a true green trans transformation requires is, is firstly to overhaul the general incentive system and, and move the big levers. No? For example, mm, it, to, to have nice small-scale renewable energy projects won't have a big effect on the energy mix unless carbon emissions are priced, for example, or fossil fuel subsidies are removed. Gaila mentioned the size of, of the problem of, of fossil fuel subsidies. There are lots of experiences available internationally of, of how to gradually phase out these um, fossil fuel subsidies and, and use the money that is freed up for, for social expenditure programs, for example. If you get these things right, then each and every firm and each and every household will consider the environmental cost of its actions. So I think these are the 
big levers. Samantha mentioned the, the structure of the South African economy, which is strongly dependent on dirty industries like steel and coal and 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 aluminum smelters and so on. So so again, a big overhaul is needed to create other pillars of the economy, and that again depends on on setting the prices right. Yeah. Same same thing with waste management projects so, so and recycling projects. Uh, if you have projects that create jobs for a few hundred workers, that's nice to have. It's, it's, it's important. But uh, unless there's a policy that, that starts by basically banning uh, waste, uh, waste products that are non-essential or involving the big companies uh, with extended producer responsibility, which basically oblige, obliges them to, to produce in a way that is more circular, for example, or taking the example of, of transport projects, unless you have regulations that make it attractive to use public transport instead of, of private cars, et cetera, you won't get anywhere. So, so I think moving away, and I think that's pretty much also a gala spirit, you know, in the, the spirit of what, what you presented us, is, is to talk about the big levers rather than the, the small interesting projects. And, and um, having said that, um, there could be big programs, but really thinking big, that are green and labor in intensive. Unemployment is currently South Africa's big, big problem. The problem that also creates um, problems of political legitimacy for the government. So I think it is the, the key political project and the uh, problem in the country. And green sectors are not always automatically more labor intensive than the old brown industries that they would replace, but there are some. For example, if you had a big program for sustainable and energy efficient cities, we are seeing a lot of urbanization happening and investing big in energy efficiency of buildings, for example, in, in, in using uh, local uh, building materials, in, in repairing and re rehabilitating infrastructure instead of scrapping it and building it new. Or another one would be massive roll, uh, roll out, out of renewable energy project, projects in rural areas, for example, where you create jobs on the one hand in installation and maintenance of solar home systems and biogas projects and, and wind products projects and so on integrated in the village economies for example at the same time you would have indirect effects um, but because you have helped to electrify the, the rural areas no these are all creators of, of, of employment I think one would have to have to prioritize those uh, those things or organic agriculture for example which is uh, more healthy, it's better for the environment, but it's also much more labor intensive than high input mechanized agriculture. And the same in, in waste management, for example. So there are lots of examples where you could uh, uh, green programs and at the same time make them more, more labor intensive. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Tillman. You've given us a, a really nice broad sense of where perhaps um, green industry, South African green industrial policies could help um, uh, the, the future economy um, thrive. And I, I would like to um, bring in Gayler as well, maybe to reflect a bit on how you, Gayler, envisage that uh, South Africa's industrial policies could help the country thrive in the economy of the future. Yes, thanks, uh, Vanessa. I think it's there's four key pillars, in, in, in my opinion, where really we need to focus on, um, and, and they got across the economy. Um, the, the first pillar is, is around building the infrastructure. Uh, and yes, we focus a lot on energy. Uh, but it's it's beyond this. You know, it's ICT, it's uh, smart cities, it's public transport, it's the ecological infrastructure in the country as well that needs to be preserved, uh, and really building the infrastructure that's required for a green economy. A lot of those new investments rely on on networks, network infrastructure, which will need to be facilitated by the state so that those economies or those sectors can thrive. 
And that's relevant energy, that's relevant transport, that's relevant communication, uh, and also, as I said, in sort of natural resource management. But the second pillar for me is improving access to sustainable services. So, you know, a massive green social housing program would bring countless benefits to the population, but also help with you know, uh, growth in construction industry and so many other uh, sectors, energy, water, sanitation, um, but also again, public transport, you know, as Sam uh, mentioned, and we need to do a lot more in, in rolling out public transport and also bringing e-mobility to the population through the public transport system because you know, car ownership in South Africa is very segregated. So if you wanna roll out e-mobility in a way that's just and inclusive, you have to do that through to public transport and recently did yep. quite a bit of work on this in, in the country. The third pillar for me is unlocking investment by the private sector. You know, as Stillman mentioned, you know, it can't all be financed by South African government or donors. You know, there's significant forces uh, in, in the private sector and households that could be unlocked through some fairly simple policy or regulatory changes, certainly in renewable energy that everybody talks about, but it's also the case in water. It's also the case in sanitation. It's also the case in the circular economy, particularly in waste management, where small changes to regulations or policy impetus could really unlock you know, a spectrum of investment from the private sector, which stand ready to invest in, in the country. And, and the fourth pillar for me is, is about really actively supporting the transition of industries to a green economy. Uh, it needs to really change, as Tom had mentioned, the sort of incentive structure that we have and making it more interesting. And in other words, if you're talking to the, pro to the private sector, profitable to invest in a green economy. Yeah. Um, and and that needs to be through the incentives um, and through all the support of industrial policy. And that needs to be done in a way that makes sure that we have a just transition. So as Gerard mentioned, we have you know, our cold fire power plants are closing down. They happen to be very concentrated in one region of the country, which is in Pumalanga. Uh, actually, it's two to three municipalities. It's not even one province. So we need a new plan for that province. You know, the cold mining and the coal fire power plants are closing down. Renewable energy can contribute to the solution, yes, but it will not be the only solution. We need a much bigger plan for the province. And here we need to roll out our suite of, of opportunities and put our efforts in saying, you know, sustainable agriculture, new opportunities in tourism, new manufacturing. We need to really think about our rejuvenation strategy. So, I mean, these are really the four pillars where you know, we can focus on through our industrial policy, and it would really bring some benefits in terms of economic development, social progress, and yes, environmental sustainability in the long run as well. Really pleased to see you raise your hand because I was going to come back to you with a question, but I'll let you go first since you seem to have a burning comment. No, I, I, just to add to the discussion, um, I think I think we need to be careful. Um, as ESCOM, I mean, ESCOM's the, the national um, obviously central power, power generator, engulfed in huge crises. So, you know, I talked about how there's, there's this historic path of development which places coal uh, and coal-fired electricity central to it. And now we have this, this sort of sort of contradictory situation whereby you know you've got a you've got this central institution in in crisis very much tied up with um with corruption um you know what we do about escom is a quite a difficult long-term issue um but one problem that escom faced did face which is going to make me sound kind to escom was under the threat of privatization because privatization has been very much part of the the agenda since 1994 escom couldn't really plan and it didn't plan and that's one of the reasons why we have the the, the the crisis that we have but then in response to then as the crisis builds you get the knee-jerk reaction which is to, oh my god let's quickly build some new powers coal power stations and let's get an enormous loans in order to do it so madupi and kasile are enormous power stations which are going to be around with, we're going to have them around for quite a while so i don't think it's accurate to, for us to 
suggests that coal is going to go away quickly. I, I want it to go away quickly, but Madupi and Kusili have cost a lot of money and they are and, and, and they will they will continue to burn a lot of coal. In in in, in relation to the can I can I carry on or should I stop? I'm clearly very concerned about being brief. <laughs> I shall follow Vanessa's lead instructions. I mean, I think you know you've made a really good point about exploiting opportunities, and that there is something which we, we should also mention, which you know South Africa has got a lot of platinum, and, and platinum's a useful a, a useful thing. You know, if you, if you think that catalytic converters reduce the carbon emissions of, of of cars, but also of public transport vehicles and so forth, and each each has got a little bit of platinum in it. You know, there's there's quite a lot of industrial policy discussion about how you make there's more um domestic use of, of of the of the platinum the vast platinum reserves that that, that south africa has and to, to 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 do to do more of that at home and export it to the world you know the the, the natural resource is is, in, is under south africa's soil so why not use that and give it as a, more of a gift to the world rather than exporting it raw for somebody else to process And I think that points to something, I think Gerhard may have been the one who talked about um, the, the big imbalance between the imports and exports of the supply chain disruption. I think it was you, Gerhard, that mentioned, um, you know, the dependence on manufacturing on imported components. And, you know, these are some of the um, materials readily available uh, in South Africa to incorporate into um, the you know goods made for the domestic market. Um, so I'm going to actually um, pick up a question um, that comes from the audience, and it's 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 really taking us right back almost to the beginning when we um, first started the discussion. Uh, a number of uh, the speakers talked about. Um, the lack of coordination and the need to improve that. Um, so this question uh, comes in two parts, and I will add a third part for Samantha. So the, the, the question is, um, what kinds of institutional arrangements would be needed to improve coordination uh, in South Africa? and um, maybe Gerhard or, or Gela could, um, could could speak to that. Uh, the second part is um, an expression of the need to have a diverse range of voices for policy um, development. Um, and I pack these all together um, because I would perhaps like maybe Samantha to pick up on the diversity issue and come back to us. You know, you you really set out the issues very well, um, Samantha. I'm looking uh, at my notes, and you know, you really highlighted the issues very well. But I wondered if you had maybe one or two very specific recommendations. Um, on on uh, addressing inequality. So um, yeah, you know, this it's not that easy when you come to one of these um, webinars on building back better. Difficult questions. Um, and Claudia, Claudia, please feel free to jump in any time that you would like to as well. Um, so, but maybe let's start with Gerhard. Um, what sorts of institutional arrangements to improve coordination and, and Kayla, great if you could also give your perspective and then uh, over to Samantha on um, diverse range of voices and any one recommendation around addressing inequality. I think I've, I've, I've heard quite a few recommendations. I must say many of the recommendations that you've made, we've obviously uh, thought about for many years, but uh, maybe something we didn't mention is, I think over the last 10 years, I might not have my numbers entirely right, the price of electricity in South Africa went up by 500%. And that was one of the biggest drivers towards the green economy, this massive electricity price increases we've had. Um, one of the programs I manage, the National Cleaner Production Center, the focuses on 
energy and resource efficiency. And the numbers we crunch there shows that uh, the bulk of industry, the, the energy efficiency improvement in industry over the last 10 years is up to 40%. So it shows a quite a massive decoupling from growth from the um, carbon intensity. And this was mainly driven by the fact that electricity is so expensive. The other thing we've seen now in the country is with this blackouts. Business must go on. So a lot of businesses make their own plans to, to generate their own electricity. So the rollout of rooftop solar is a, is a very big industry in South Africa. So ultimately, at the end of the day, the interesting thing is, um, despite the lack of coordination, a lot of the right things are happening. Um, but I mean, the the question you asked is what institutional arrangements? And I'm and and what I see, there is an understanding at the highest level in government about this lack of coordination and this master plan approach that have been introduced over the last year. I think has proven to be quite successful, uh, and and we've got a lot of hope for that. We must remember the previous ten years. We've seen quite a lot of political interference in our economy in South Africa, if we can put it like that. And that is that is probably also been quite a, a problem in this space. So the the uh, I mentioned in my when I talked earlier that we we don't have a lack of plans. We've got a lot of policy, we've got a lot of ideas. We really understand what to do. Uh, it's just a case of to get everybody to get a meeting of minds and to get buy-in, and 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 you know, in any uh, new new democracy, you've got challenges that you basically will take takes a few years to overcome. But um, I'm confident at the moment that we are slowly getting there. No lack of plans, and I know this um, issue of, uh, of of lack of coordination is not something that's unique to South Africa. I don't think either. Um, gosh, it's all heating up now, and I, 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 let's just keep going. I, I'm looking at the time and just seeing there's so much more to discuss. Maybe Gayla, if you don't mind me skipping the institutional question maybe we can come back to that after since Gerhard has provided quite quite a lot of uh to reflect on unless you had something that was really going to change uh spin the universe on its axes um I, I would like to jump across to Samantha and then quickly to Tillman before I, I move the conversation along thanks Okay, on the on the diversity issue, I, I mean, one thing again in praise of the report that we're discussing today. I mean, if you look at the list of people who were interviewed to give their feedback on 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 green, the green industrial policy in South Africa, it's a very impressive and long in, and in, inclusive list. I'd say it's fairly rare to have to to, to 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 take into account so many so many voices because when you think obviously the people who are most affected by by mining, obviously, and and the the kind of the the, the demands that places on water, um, and which which are generally taken away from local uh, the local communities, you know, who suffer terribly from the consequences and the impact of mining, and of, often in in in, very, in in conditions of poor employment, other other employment opportunities, and and poor water water supply, and their voice is very 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 you know very rarely listened to, um, and and and. Their experiences should be very, very much be part of the of of, of the debate. Um, that, that obviously the question of who has power, you know, that's a very, very, very important question, and that you know, making green industrial policy everywhere is a as a long term, difficult, messy process. Partly because there are very many uh, corporations in the world who benefit from. Um, uh, uh, very unhealthy and and destructive uh, industries, and you know, one, I mean, it's a it's a very difficult. How you deal with mining in South Africa is a very difficult question because on the one hand you have commodity periods of commodity booms, where sadly um, too little too little is made of those gains. Those gains are not distributed throughout the the population. We know we see it again and again. But then in times of commodity a collapse of commodity prices. 
obviously mining companies say life's very difficult and mining and life is very difficult for them and so how you 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 get that 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 right is i'm not suggesting is easy and then it's it made all the more complicated in south africa by many of them have, have offshored so you get very very powerful mining companies who were now listed overseas and who are not who, whilst having developed and grown up inside south africa on used south african labor and south african minerals are now listed elsewhere and they export profits abroad and and, 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 and so forth so you know they're, they're, they're tough issues but I would I would make a couple of points in relation to uh, pol policy me measures about around inequality, and I'd make two if you don't mind, if I'm allowed. One, a wealth tax. Piketty's clearly argued for a wealth tax for some time. Would raise a lot of money in South Africa, is, and, and 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 I think is 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 perfectly doable. But also more 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 efforts to control and to tax the the financial system, and maybe some sort of financial transactions tax, because. You know, South Africa's got a very imbalanced economy. One part of that imbalance is that we've got a very large financial sector, very large, powerful, and it really quite a non-developmental financial sector, which doesn't channel money towards long-term productive green investment. So actually, you see huge amounts of speculation, a lot of speculation on the RAND. So the RAND is a highly unstable currency because speculators come in and, and, and go out, partly because interest rates have been kept appallingly high. High interest rates, you know, suit some people, but they're actually, in my opinion, you know, very, 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 very harsh consequences for South, Af South African people. Uh, so I definitely, we need to definitely think about measures along those two lines. Thank you, uh, Samantha. I'm going to, um, Tillman, did you, you, you had your hand raised? Yes. So I'll let you speak very briefly and then, I have another question for um, our experts this afternoon. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me quickly. Uh, what I wanted to say uh, links up pretty much, uh, pretty well with uh, uh, what Samantha just mentioned. So I just wanted to to um, to um, point out that it's quite often not a problem of coordination. Coordination assumes that everybody has uh, the same interests and it's just a matter of people don't know. They are too stupid for talking to talk to each other. And and usually there's a political economy behind it. There are interest group and vested interests behind it. And, and for example, um, uh, obviously, um, Sasol and ESCOM and these big uh, uh, firms that are driving the economy, South African economy have a lot of vested interests. And, and I think the challenge is to show that uh, renewable energy can bring electricity costs down. It's good for everyone. That um, uh, uh, the, the, we, the, the country may run into a big carbon bubble, bubble if, if, if the world uh, uh, burns less, less coal. Um, uh, uh, the, the country may run into deep economic uh, pro uh, problems unless measures are taken now, or that renewable energy avoids bailouts. What what Gera just said, or that monopolies are usually bad for the for consumers and for the economy, and that that's why it's better to have an independent producer, uh, um, a power producer um, uh, legislation no? that that basically diversifies the energy system. So I think it's a matter of creating a narrative that shows basically that uh, economically we can be better off than with what what currently had. But the problem is that there are vested interests for those who are established in the existing indus industry, the coal miners and all the big companies, but there are no vested interests yet in the industries that might emerge by, by saying high-tech platinum uh, projects or something like that, because they are not yet established, right? So, so that, that's a, a problem. It, it creates a political imbalance in favor of the, the old un unsustainable way of doing, doing economy. So I think it's a task to create a, a credible narrative to say, look, what, what might be coming is much more promising than what we currently, currently have. And also the banking uh, um, sector, the, uh, where they are lending, for example, they're very conservative. So it's easier to lend for to what's already existing than to lend what, what might emerge in the future. And maybe on the inequality, a few of the programs that I mentioned, for example, in terms of uh, urban en energy efficiency programs and renewable energy programs, etc., are basically creating jobs for unemployed and unskilled, fairly unskilled people. So they are, in a way, also very pro-poor and distributive. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Super interesting. And you know, um, I think this the crisis that we've all faced this year, year has given us a small window of opportunity to to really create that narrative and to really, um, you know, change the balance of where the vested interests are. You know, and I I, I think it would uh, it we we all must really focus on not losing this window of opportunity um, that, that, that's presented um, itself to us because we've had a glimpse of um, how badly things, how bad things could become. And I, there's, there's, we still have this bit of fear that would uh, motivate us to, to actually change um, the way that we do things going forward. There's no conversation that I can be in without um, talking about MSMEs coming from the International Trade Center and uh, informal sector workers as well, um, producers and so on. Um, I'm losing track of who spoke about these big leaders. It may have been you, Tillman, again. Um, and the, the need to really pull on big leaders to drive uh, long-term transformation. Um, and it strikes me that in the South African economy, uh, informal sector workers, MSMEs, critical, critical. Um, so I, it's, it's really an open question to the experts to reflect a bit on the role that MSMEs and informal sector workers would have to play in all of this. And um, I guess to answer the question as to how engaged are they and how involved are they in, in all of this. Gayla is nodding his head, so I will. Thank you. Yes, thank you. No, look, it's critical. I think, you know, just to, to talk again about the dynamics around vested interest, of course, it's not your MSME that has a vested interest. And and the, the choice is, is twofold. It's either we carry on with business as usual, you know, and the, vest, the vested interest in, 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 in the economy prevail, and in the risk the economy, South African economy, are huge in terms of exports, for example. You know, at the moment the European Union implements a border carbon tax 2023, South African exports are going to be deeply, deeply impacted by this, definitely. Or we say, well, actually, let's look at the rewards. You know, the transition to an inclusive green economy brings so many rewards. You know, we talked about some of the opportunities in 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 in, in mining and in hydrogen uh, in recycling and that's the opportunity to bring new entrepreneurs into the system new companies really you know we did significant amount of work looking at small business development in energy in water and sanitation in waste because here you're basically challenging the incumbents and you're saying you we are trying to bring a new type of companies going forward you know despite the fact that this african economy is very concentrated small businesses already account for the majority of employment you know if we look at both the formal and the informal sector and that's often neglected you know we tend to think well it's only the sassel and the escom of this world and the, the johannesburg stock exchange that's dominating the economy sure they are missing the most amount of money but they're not the one creating the most employment in the economy. You know, small businesses are actually. So I think the green economy is a critical opportunity to do that, to give them a boost. And I think we need to make that link really explicit going forward. Tillman, a quick comment. Oh, sorry, where no, do we go? <laughs> Tillman, a then quick uh, comment from Samantha, and then I, I have uh, the final final finale question. Tillman. Well, thank you. On on the um, informal economy, um, I think one one thing that is that I uh, also South Africa is employing is is a public works program for for poor people. 
And I think this is uh, something that is particularly important now in the COVID uh, area where you have huge um, uh, um, and massive increases of unemployment and, and creating basic income for very poor uh, uh, um, families. And I think in South Africa, there are interest, interesting examples of, of creating those public works programs uh, for things that are also pro-green in a way you know, of, of working uh, for forests, for example, for water, for for wetlands and so on, wetland rehabilitation, things like that. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. also a win-win type of thing because you can address immediately. That's not a structural change. It's a more short-term measure, but it is pro-green and, and also um, and pro-poor at the same time. And the other thing that I would uh, say about the question about how um, to, to, to shield the, the poor and the informal economy from the costs of going green, because there are also costs involved. But for example, in, in, in terms of sequencing, and also, I have also seen in South Africa quite interesting uh, programs. If you want to have, for example, uh, mandatory measures to make uh, buildings greener and more energy efficient, you start with commercial buildings and with uh, uh, public buildings and then maybe with upper class and middle class residential areas and, and at the very end you may also apply then measures to low cost uh, housing or so and, and those should then of course be subsidized and affordable. No? But I think that applies to each and every type of green reform to, uh, to build in the distributive uh, elements in it and start kind of sequencing with the rich and then, then um, um, applying it to the poor. Thank you, Tillman. I'm going to have to ask next time to have two hours for this type of discussion because this, I feel like there's still so much, four hours, there's still so much more to discuss. Samantha, if you could, you know, in 30 yeah. seconds, your comments. Yeah. A very, there's a, I think I'd make a, draw a very quick contrast when it comes to recycling between where I work in a university where we don't recycle. I mean, I mean certainly compared to European universities, you'd have a, you know, people don't recycle at the photocopier. They don't, I mean, the recycling is dreadful at my university and, and in many other universities. Compare that with waste pickers, you know, the informal recyclers who do an absolutely brilliant, brilliant job. And, you know, I'm, you know, I'm sure there's research into it that shows what a, what an important contribution to recycling they make at at, at a purely informal purely informal level. What a paradox! The people yeah. who know who are supposed to know uh, the most about this. Um, so let let's quickly move to um, wrapping up in. Um, 10 seconds, if I could have Gerhard and Tillman give me one or two things in 10 seconds each, um, how South Africans can support green industrial transformation in the region, because the region is a very important dimension that we haven't had a chance to really cover um, properly this afternoon. But maybe next time we'll be invited again to, to keep part two of this conversation. Do you want to go get hard first and then tell me? I'll just mention one, two or three projects. So um, there's a huge demand for batteries in the electric vehicle industry predicted for the next decade or so. So the bulk of these minerals are in, available in Southern Africa. So there's a big opportunity to beneficiate those minerals instead of exporting like samantha said the minerals we can beneficiate it and add a lot of value the region uh, there's a lot of opportunity to buy and sell electricity in the region we've got hydro in the region we've got a number of private investors that are keen to export renewable energy to the region and then the biggest opportunity really is to get a, a free trade agreement going but a real free trade agreement i travel quite a lot into uh, Botswana and Africa uh, by vehicle. And if you look at the borders, the trucks sometimes stand two, three kilometers long at border posts. Uh, I've heard stories that to drive from South Africa to Congo and back takes three months. So to really get rid of the red tape and improve efficiency, get rid of corruption, um, that can go a long way to, to improve the, the region. 
Thank you very much. And unfortunately, our time is up. So I'm actually going to have a rude um, break right here um, and just say that this is why we have the ambitious um, African Continental Free Trade Area project. Um, and, and that's a, a, another big topic of discussion for another day. Um, our time is up. I thank you so much to um, our incredible panel of experts. It's been a really great discussion. I'm sure like many of you in the audience, you've learned a lot. Um, thank you very much to the Green Growth Knowledge Platform, to UNEP, and to all of you who joined us this afternoon. Have a fantastic rest of the day wherever you are. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.